This is Making a Scientist, the podcast by young scientists for young scientists, and hosted by me, Alex Ainsco. This week, my guest is Dr. John Tregoning, who's a reader or associate professor in respiratory infections in the Department of Infectious Diseases at Imperial College London. In this episode, hear all about RNA vaccines, what they are, how they work in the body, how they're being used to combat COVID, and how this technology can be leveraged in future to tackle other major global health problems. John is a scientist that I really admire. He's very focused on the idea of making academia more accessible and fair, and provides regular honest views and opinions on this matter through his science blog, which I'd strongly encourage you to check out. He's also a regular columnist for Nature Careers. His perspective on being a working parent in this episode is also incredibly interesting, and I'm sure will be very relatable to many of you that are listening. I really can't wait to share this conversation with you all and to get your feedback, because it was a genuine pleasure to record. So, without any further ado, let's begin. I'd very much like to start by talking about what your area of research is and, um, and, and its impact in the world. So, so what do you work on? So I'm an immunologist and I work on respiratory infections. So I look at how viruses and bacteria get into your lungs and then how your body fights them off once you're infected. So. Awesome. So um, which, which diseases in particular are you interested in? So I've worked for a long time on a virus called respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, which is a virus that infects children in the first two years of life. And most children, all children will get it and some will get very sick with it, about 5% of them. So in a normal year, in the winter season in a UK hospital, the children's wards will be full of babies which are sick with this virus. It's slightly different this year because of all the distancing measures have changed a lot of the um, the spread of different non-COVID infections. But Mm -hmm. and it'd be interesting to see where that goes from here on. Okay, so what are the implications of RSV in children? So RSV has two things. So in terms of in the short term impact, it causes an acute bronchiolitis which is a swelling and an inflammation of the lungs and that can lead them to needing um, supplemental air or to be intubated to, to keep them alive. In the long term it can actually damage their lungs in a way that may lead to wheezing and asthma later in life so it has a sort of short-term and a long-term effect and in countries that haven't have a kind of less um, resources and uh, the hospitals don't have as many high intensity beds it is a serious uh, cause of death because they you, mm-hmm. in order to keep the children alive you have to be able to intubate them and if you don't have that technology then the children die unfortunately oh so what are you doing in your lab to address these problems so we're taking a range of different approaches one area that we're particularly interested in is how does it actually make you sick so once the virus gets into your body what drives the disease is it the virus that makes you sick or is it your immune response to the virus or is it the kind of interplay between the two things and we're particularly currently interested in um, how it change viral infections changes behaviors we've seen that in the models that we use that a virus infection actually changes um, eating patterns and this is all in mouse models Mm -hmm. and the mice stop eating and that that's what kind of makes them more sick so we're trying to understand what it is about the immune response to the virus that makes the mice not want to eat anymore and then is that relevant in the human situation and, and does that provide new opportunities for therapy? So do children have the similar uh, symptoms to a mice? Do they not want to eat? There is a, an element where they don't feed as much um, and that may be part of the problem and it may cause the kind of increased weakness. So, But that could be, we don't know whether that is a direct kind of behavioural thing or it's to do with the way the airways are blocked up because of their obligate, because they have to drink milk rather than kind of eating food. Mm. Okay, fair enough. And then um, I suppose, why does it affect children and not really affect adults so much? So, so because everyone's had it by the time they're two, everyone has a basal immunity to it. So the, the virus basically gets you early in life because you see it for the first time and then you build up a decent immune response against it and then you don't get infected with it again. Mm-hmm. This is because it's been around with humans for ages. So you, the, only, the only new people to infect are babies. Oh, I see. Okay. So you mentioned before about how things have changed since the pandemic and, um, you know, you, you've seen that the wards, are, the distribution of, of patients in wards is different. So do you think that um, a lot of these social distancing measures have meant that 
babies have not been getting RSV um, now and what other potential implications do you think of, of that? So it's a really interesting question. It's really interesting why the measures that um, have been so effective against influenza and RSV have have are effective against SARS, but not to the same extent. You've still got circulating SARS in spite of the social distancing, whereas these other di- diseases have really been disappeared this much in this winter in the UK f- flu season, for example, has been very, very little. Okay. What the suggestion is from a lot of the epidemiologists and the modelers is that there will be a delayed peak in flu and RSV this year. So we might see a summer flu season this year just because everything's delayed and the amount of kind of herd immunity might have slightly dipped or the amount of kind of prevalent immunity has dipped and the virus can get back in, especially as people start to mix more. But we really don't know. And it's really it's very interesting to see what will happen to the non well to all of the virus transmission over this mm. summer. Yeah, totally. What do you expect will happen? <laughs> I don't know. My guess is that there might be based on maybe Australia, there may be increases in the summer, which we wouldn't normally see, but I don't think it'd be as severe as a normal winter RSV season. Is it something to be concerned about? Right, for for any new parents out there who might be listening. No. So RSV is not in certainly in the UK, RSV is not gonna kill your child. Um there's a risk that it will make them sick and needing hospitalization. And so if you if they start behaving, you know, have symptoms of a very severe respiratory infection, so if they become listless and can't breathe, it's always worth looking at the NHS, going on one one one. And, and kind of referring it onwards. But it's not a cause, a dramatic cause for concern. No. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. The thing that I'm really excited to talk to you about is, uh, is RNA vaccines. So RNA vaccines are incredibly topical right now. And uh, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns, and I'm hoping that you, you might be able to uh, explain and alleviate a few of these. So we've prepared a few questions for you. So um, I'd, I'd firstly like to start by asking, how do you get the chip inside the vaccine? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. No, what is what is <laughs> what is an RNA vaccine? Um, what what is it in simple terms? So, so an RNA. So the way that your body makes proteins is through RNA. So the in the nuclear in your cells you have a DNA molecule, and that's like the lending library that the information is kept on. So all the central information is stored on the DNA. And the way your body actually responds to things is by making proteins. And the instructions for the proteins are stored on the RNA. But there needs to be a molecule that shuttles from the middle of the cell, the nucleus of the cell, to the ribosomes, which are like 3D printers that make the proteins. And RNA is that molecule. So if you put RNA into a cell, the cell will make a protein. And so in the case of RNA vaccines, instead of making the protein for, say, insulin or hair or collagen, Mm -hmm. you take an artificial piece of RNA, which encodes a small part of the SARS coronavirus. So it's called the spike protein, Mm -hmm. which is the protein on the surface of the virus that the virus uses to get into human cells. And so if you get an RNA that encodes the spike protein and inject it into human cells, the cells will start making copies of this protein the spike protein okay and that's useful to your immune system because the immune system then sees the spike protein and recognizes it as a threat and makes an immune response against it particularly an antibody response so that when you then see the virus for real your antibodies can bind up the virus and kill it and prevent it from ever infecting you okay this is a common question that you you see banding about but does it change my dna no (laughs) <laughs> so RNA is a completely different molecule. They what they're injecting into you is a small piece of message that cannot turn back into DNA. So DNA goes to RNA, RNA doesn't go to DNA. So the RNA can't change your DNA and it won't integrate. It'll basically it will make the protein that the vaccine is targeting and then it will be degraded and got rid of. Okay. Cool. How long does that process typically take, uh, the, the making uh, and degrading of the proteins? Is it something, yeah, how long is that? So, so there seems to be, in certainly in models, there's an acute peak of uh, production of the foreign protein. So the vaccine protein peaks 24 hours after the immunization, and then it's rapidly cleared from the body. So that would be a process of both the RNA being degraded and the protein itself being removed by the immune system. 
I see. Okay. So the underlying biology seems pretty sound, and obviously it's getting to be uh, to be approved by a lot of regulators in in different um, places around the world. And one of the main vaccines, of course, is the Pfizer uh, BioNTech. I think it's pronounced uh, Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine. And uh, you were somebody who were publishing with BioNTech before it was cool, before it all became mainstream. Um, but uh, I think a, a lot of the confusion and, and, and distrust perhaps ar uh, arises because people don't understand why RNA vaccines have been able to be produced so quickly. Um, is it a case of um, uh, you know uh, red tape being cut? Um, is it a case of there's a lot of sh corners that have been cut? Like what? How how, are the, how has it been able to have been produced so quickly? Yeah. So so the answer is it it isn't a one year program of work. It's the tenth of a 10 year program of work all of the vaccines that have come about for SARS this in the last 12 months are building on previous existing platforms so a lot of the underpinning research the basic clinical studies the um, safety studies have been done before and the advantage of RNA is that you can quickly switch over the vaccine you're making so the the factory that makes the RNA COVID vaccine this week could be altered very quickly and easily to making a flu vaccine next week or a TB vaccine because the same technology is used to manufacturing the same uh, to manufacture the same material okay and that means that the the process this platform is called platform vaccine technology is quicker in terms of how you make the vaccine in the first place I see. so the first thing was that the platforms existed but the second thing is that a lot a lot of the time that it takes to license a vaccine or to produce a vaccine is often in the funding and the decision cycle of how to proceed during the process. And so what would normally happen is that the the safety trial would be done, be like a small safety trial would be done. There would then be a pause while the manufacturer then sought more money to manufacture the bigger safety trial. And then there'd be another pause while they went on to do the, the larger efficacy study. So all of those pauses in between have been removed and a lot of the manufacturing was done at economic risk. So the companies that were making it were making big batches of vaccine ready for the next stage of the process, fully knowing that if the vaccine was unsafe or ineffective, they'd just have to pull the plug and, and get rid of millions of dollars of investment. So they took an economic risk to move it forward. But the safety process and the review process is the same and as rigorous as it has been for all of the other vaccines that are currently used. Okay, so um, in terms of the ability to develop vaccines to to new um, strains of coronavirus, which is one of the things you know, it's a scary term that's being thrown about with variants, and people don't understand necessarily what it what it means. Um, but the uh, there's been a lot of talk in in the news about how we can quickly make a new um, a new vaccine for these new variants. So my question is, do we have to go through the entire process again, or can you just use the packaging material and update the, the thing that's inside the box? So so there will almost certainly be have to be a, a another safety study on the new variant vaccine. So they'll have to go through the same safety process just to make sure it's safe and in, in people. What may be quicker is that they may not require such a large efficacy study they might not require it to be tested to show that it prevents the infection in the first place because you might be able to use something called a correlate of protection or an equivalence which is where you measure the immune response to your original vaccine and say well we know that the original vaccine gives us 92 percent protection and it gives us an antibody level of 100. Mm -hmm. if your antibody level of if your new vaccine also gives you an antibody level of 100 you can extrapolate and say, well, we think that will therefore protect us in the same way. So it may be that you can, me by measuring the immune response, you can make inferences about how protective it will be. And that would accelerate the process and mean that you can go from a safety trial into a rollout more quickly. What is a rough kind of time frame on, on something like that? So if you do like a really sort of back of cigarette packet calculation it took 60 days from the sequence of the vac of the virus to come out till the first human dose was administered in the trial so back in this was in march last year there was two months between the sequence being known and the first dose being made mm -hmm. that clinical trial would take say eight weeks 
so that there is in theory you could be rolling out vaccines four months from the new sequence being known wow. but this require would require a would definitely require different approach by regulators in terms of how they approach the efficacy question so there's a theoretical it could take less than five months but I, there's no telling yet whether that's going to be the case I mean, to me, it sounds incredible. You know, the pace of development and 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 technological advancement is it's it, it's awesome. But I mean, I am also uh, I understand why people have their reservations and why people are distrustful of this process. But why do you think people are distrust distrustful, and what do you think we can do to calm any kind of anxieties? So, so I think there's there's a, I think it's important to stress it's not always distrust it's mm-hmm. un, it's hesitancy yeah the people number of people who are out and out and against vaccines is somewhere around naught percent there's a very very small number of vocal people who make a lot of noise most people are hesitant or they have issues with getting to the vaccine clinic or there's there's a whole complicated mess of why people don't get vaccinated so i think people by and large do trust the vaccines and I think the demonstration now that it's been out in 300 million people and it's safe and it's stopping people getting sick mm. is, is the kind of proof that people probably need to say, yeah, this is fine. We'll carry on using it. So do you think there's always going to be an undercurrent of people who just simply will never take a, a, the vaccine? And then as such, you'll we'll end up with COVID being around just forever. It's never going to be. A no, I, I think the numbers are so small that if everyone else got vaccinated, that the way that herd immunity works, that it would it would it is possible to get rid of it. So it's been other diseases have disappeared in spite of people being anti-vax. So I think it. I don't think they have a. It, as long as, as long as their voices are not being amplified, I don't think they have a significant impact on how disease spread. Yeah, sure. And social media, for sure, has a huge role to play in that. But I think we, you know, we as scientists, we have a huge role in our communication to sort of may help help people to under understand um it's yeah it's it's a huge undertaking and yeah there's a there's a big divide it seems uh, at the moment and anything that we can do to bridge that gap is is great um so i think uh maybe i'll ask a few a couple of other um uh, technical questions then um so can you multiplex um and by that i mean can you put multiple uh, strains of rna within the same vaccine shot and then therefore you get uh, immunity to a whole bunch of different things all at the same time. So my feeling is potentially not. And also that I'm not sure what you gain by doing that. If you could do several injections, though painful in different sites, I think it's probably going to be safer and more effective. There's a, there is a, to my mind, biological, not risk, but there's a, there's a chance that just one would outcompete the other or like, if you're making one protein, the other protein will be silenced. And there's the we don't understand how that happens well enough to justify the kind of small saving that you'd have in like glass vials, whereas you could have two separate injections and put them into two different arms. OK, OK, makes sense. Um, so there are uh, I have a couple of questions about the different types of vaccines that are available now um so obviously the AstraZeneca one uh so this is the um the, the modified uh, virus which is not um mRNA based uh so this is has been touted as being more feasible for use in the developing world so um this is because of the, the pretty much the transport and the logistics and the storage and the infrastructure that are in is in the developing world. So, um, do you think we'll get to a point where mRNA vaccines are? It's going to be feasible to use them in the developing world, um, and also just as an addition to that, maybe why you might be able to address why there's a need for such a low storage temperature of typically around minus eighty. Yeah. So. Uh, starting with the temperature, RNA itself is inherently unstable. It can auto hydrolyze. So basically it can break itself down. It, it, it catalyzes its own destruction. So if unless it's stored at a very cold temperature, then that reaction can render it useless. Uh, and that's the that's why it has to be kept at these very low temperatures. They're the kind of the next big thing in, in developing these vaccines for low middle income countries is to stabilize it to heat stabilize it so it can be used at, at a a more either minus 20 or in the, the temperature of a fridge like a plus four so 
those are the kind of the big challenges. I, I don't see why it's not achievable. Um, it just requires some research and development in those areas. Okay. Okay. I suppose the same extends to price, then research and development comes and, you know, price will go down because at the moment that was another question. The AstraZeneca one is, um, is, is, uh, is a whole lot cheaper. Um, so, so that, that actually, some of that is down to manufacturer's preference. So the, the Astra vaccine, because of, of the way it was, the collaboration was set up by Oxford, was deliberately designed to be manufactured at cost. So there, nobody's making a profit out of the Astra vaccine. So that it's not necessarily that it's cheaper to make. It's just it is being sold for less. Okay. So other vaccines may there may come out um, other kind of not for profit versions of mRNA vaccines, which will be cheaper. So so there's not nothing inherently more expensive about one platform or the other. It's just how people have chosen to sell them. Is it easier to make the AstraZeneca vaccine at scale versus the RNA vaccines at scale? Uh, because this, this is the big thing, isn't it? Like trying to get everybody vaccinated and the vaccination drive, making sure there's enough for all. Uh, to, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't see why one should be like the One's a biological process and the other is, is a kind of manufacturing process. There's, I don't know enough about it to be able to say why whether one is more cheap than the other. Okay, no worries. Um, okay, so uh, do you reckon that RNA vaccines are the future of vaccine development? Like, there's, you know, they will outcompete all of the other um, the other types of vaccine, and everyone will just use those. So they certainly won't outcompete all of the existing vaccines because there's no need to to introduce a new vaccine. You have to do all of the trials and all of the efficacy and show that it is comparable or better to what we already have mm -hmm. and the vaccines we already have can be made for a dollar a dose and there's no so there's no economic uh, requirement to make new vaccines against the ones that have work and have worked for 150 years so it won't replace the existing range of childhood vaccines what it may be or sorry or the general vaccines people use what it may be useful for is then to start either for new viruses, like newly emerging viruses. So if there's another pathogen, disease X, pandemic, yeah. then an RNA vaccine may well be part of that. Or it may be for ones that we don't have a cure for. So the virus I work on, RSV, there's no vaccine for. So it may be that the, an, an RNA vaccine for RSV would be effective. Mm -hmm. Or the area that I think is most exciting is for um, influenza vaccines. So... Um, Influenza is a seasonal virus and it changes each year. The strains that are circulating change each year. And one of the problems often is with vaccination is that the vaccines have to be made nine months in advance to get enough material ready to, to put into the um, human population in the autumn. Mm -hmm. If you could manufacture a vaccine in four months, back to the conversation we had before, if you, if you know the sequence and you can make a vaccine within four months that's effective and can be regulated... You can you can be much closer to what the virus is during the season, or you could even look at what happens at the beginning of the season and change your vaccine mid-season to something that's more reflective and more protective. So I think they will have a big impact on influenza vaccines, and then there are diseases to which I think RNA vaccines may not be the answer, and I think there may be limitations in making bacterial vaccines. Um, well, vaccines against bacterial pathogens with an RNA vaccine. So something like TB may not be solved with RNA vaccines. And this comes down to a kind of a nuance of how proteins are made. Viruses use the human cells to make copies of themselves. So they make essentially human proteins, whereas bacteria make their own proteins and they use different machinery to make it. And so when it comes out of the protein factory, the bacterial vaccines look somewhat different to the human vaccines and that's to do with the sugars and the things that are stuck on the outside of the proteins mm -hmm. and those may not be happening in an rna vaccines against tb because you'd be making it look like a human and not like a bacteria so i think that i don't think it's going to be the cure for everything okay okay um can somebody be over vaccinated <laughs> no <laughs> so I don't, I don't think there's ever been a case like, you know, we're exposed to so many things that we don't get vaccines against. There's bit, you know, we walk through a microbial world, we breathe in 10,000 bacteria every breath. So, no, I don't think you can over vaccinate the system. 
So, I mean, to maybe by extension then, uh, just as a little bit of a, a forecast, maybe it's science fiction, but 200 years time, we have vaccines for absolutely everything that's uh, left, right and centre. And um, there's obviously the in, in the developing world, uh, there is, uh, sorry, in the uh, in the developed world, there's the, uh, the hygiene hypothesis for why people get sick a lot more. So do you think that vaccine technology is going to end up getting to a point where, um, yeah, we, we're vaccinated against everything, both uh, viral and um, microbial. And then, yeah, we, yeah. Well, what do you think? So I, so I don't think that will be a problem because I think vaccines will only ever be brought out for pathogenic uh, microorganisms. And a lot of what trains the immune response is your gut flora or the, the bacteria that are on your skin or on your mother's skin or that you exposed when you're born. So I, the what what trains the immune system isn't necessarily the pathogens that cause you disease they're just the things that you live with so i think i think there'll be a happy balance between the two okay um what do you think is the most uh well or for rna vaccines um what do you think is the is, is the disease which the if, if there was to be a new rna vaccine it would have the most impact in combating so the biggest disease that doesn't have a vaccine anywhere on the horizon is HIV. Um, so an HIV vaccine, if it could be made with an RNA, would be an incredible, incredible change in the in in the world. There's 33 million people infected with HIV, so that would be the biggest thing. Conceptually, it's a very difficult problem to solve. So it may, you know, RNA may not be enough to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. In the shorter term, I think replacing seasonal flu or faster response to seasonal flu or pandemic flu is probably where rna vaccines will have the next biggest impact as well as yeah protecting us from the next pathogen x the next pandemic yeah yeah sure um so something i, I uh, forgot to ask uh, but i think is really important when we were talking about the feasibility of use in the developing world so obviously yeah the, the heat is a is a, um, is a big problem um, so it, maybe you could just give a, a very brief overview on uh, what's being done to tackle this. Is there uh, research being done to yeah uh, to, to stabilize mRNA more? How is that? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think there are, are a number of different kind of and, and this get just out of my field a bit into more chemical engineering. But I think there are a number of approaches people are looking at to uh, stabilize it or something called lyophilize, where you dry down the vaccine very rapidly and you stop the water being in there so it, it can't break down so there are chemical uh industrial approaches that may be effective but okay. it's a bit outside my scope yeah no worries that's a that's a perfect answer to be honest um yeah i i personally thought that uh lyophilize like how you receive your primers you know when you when you order them i thought something like that might be might be the way forward um Okay, uh, can we consider uh, beyond um, RNA vaccines in terms of, uh, do you think RNA vaccines can be used in gene replacement therapy? So instead of using uh, gene editing techniques such as CRISPR, um, you could transiently change the expression of a, of, of a protein for, you know, whatever reason. Yeah, so I think so I think there will be some diseases for which protein replacement therapy is an effective approach. And so rather than injecting people with a protein, you could inject them with an RNA, which will produce the protein. And it may be that that's cheaper and because it's produced in the right cells gets to the right place. So so I think there are options in terms of kind of uh, therapeutics rather than vaccines. That was all for RNA vaccines. So thank you very much. I don't know if there's anything um, more you wanted to maybe comment on in terms of, uh, I don't know, just maybe the. Um, the way that society in, in, in general just views uh, vaccines, not particularly RNA vaccines, like just to close out the section. So I think it's been I think it's been a positive reinforcement of the uptake of vaccines. If you look at the UK uptake of vaccines this year, um, to date, 93 percent of the eligible over 80s have taken up their vaccine. People are queuing up to get their vaccines. They're tweeting when they've got them. They're very excited that actually we've seen the disruption the pathogens can cause. And here's something that you can use to, to get you back to normal life. So I think it's it's it, often vaccines make infectious diseases invisible. So you don't necessarily know anyone who's had polio. So you wonder why I have it. But we all know somebody who's had COVID. We all know somebody who's got long COVID and bad symptoms from it. And actually, it's, it shows that vaccines are an incredibly powerful tool. So I think it's in in some ways it's been a beneficial year to re-emphasize the value of this kind of 
incredible human endeavor. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. Um, maybe I just wanted to add in sneaking one final question there about um, long COVID. Uh, so some people get it, some people don't. Um, is there any um, like explanation as to as to why this is yet? Uh, yeah. I, I don't, I, no idea. No I idea, think it's yeah. something to do with the cells in face, but it, yeah, it's weird. So I don't think anyone knows yet. Thank you so much so far for the uh, amazing overview on COVID vaccines. Uh, I'd now like to go on to the next section, which is talking about when you were young. So I'd like to start, please, by asking you, um, where did you grow up and where, where are you from? So I grew up in uh, a town called Berkhamsted, which is in Hertfordshire. It's northwest of London. It's just outside the M25, uh, sort of classic commuter belt town. <laughs> yeah. So what did you uh, what did you go on to study as an undergraduate? So I, I studied um, genetics as a kind of final year undergraduate. So I, and my sort of final project was looking at fruit fly nervous system development. And that was really wow. the first. I think I'd always enjoyed science at school and kind of enjoyed the problem. So it, it is different as a like school subject. It's kind of problem solving. You know, you're given a, a, a set type of question and you answer it and it's very much yes you can get it right or no you get it wrong yeah. or, you know that it's quite a, it was quite sort of almost like a pub quiz kind of approach to learning it's kind of cram all the stuff in burp it back out onto the page and at university is where you in the final year was the first time i kind of started doing science that nobody else had done you go from the one of the people at yeah, imperial describes it as you go from being a consumer of knowledge to a producer of knowledge exactly and there's a really brilliant flip that probably most of us have had of where you've done something for the first time that nobody else has ever done and my super, my undergraduate supervisor was a guy called professor stephen russell we were looking down the microscope at something i wasn't sure it had worked and he said, you know, the thing you're seeing now, nobody else in the world knows. You, you are you are unique in this moment of, of understanding that. And it's described as a book by Hope Jaron, who's an American plant biologist in a book called Lab Girl. Mm -hmm. And she said the moment she knew she wanted to be a career scientist was when she had seen something unique. She'd worked really hard on a microscope or something and seen a unique thing that nobody else had ever seen before. And it's I think it's that kind of those small moments that kind of drive well, certainly a lot of people I know drive you and keep you within science. I think us as supervisors, it's important to emphasize like when somebody's done something amazing and seen something new and it's those kind of little bits that build to it. So I think that was what happened at undergraduate that began me at least probably on the path to carry on being a scientist. Oh, cool. That's really cool. What advice would you give to a young person who's considering entering into an undergraduate degree? As an undergraduate, yeah. so I think be as broadly flexible as possible. The subjects that you know about at school are not necessarily going to be the things that fascinate you at undergraduate or go on to a PhD. So I do immunology now, but I didn't really start studying immunology until after I finished my PhD. So the... If if you start shutting yourself down into a certain route and say I'm only going to study this one very small bit, you are you because you don't know what is in the world out there. You're going to shut down a whole number of avenues. So I think be as open as possible, be as interested as possible, and the big thing at undergraduate is that it, you are responsible for the learning, and it's not about the amount of facts that you can cram into your head is about learning how to learn. There's a bit, there's, we all carry the world's information in our pockets. Now you don't, in some way, you don't need to know things. You need to know how to access them and how to connect them and how to think problems through. How to filter it is very important as well. You know, choosing the right source. That's uh, something that, yeah, is often there's just information overload, right? So, so I think it's, it's learning the tools rather than learning the knowledge. And, and I, like it, it don't look at people further down the track and think they they know what they're doing or they've always had a plan like none of us actually really like it look you can i could tell a very effective retrospective story about how i got here but i could also tell the more honest forward going story of 
I finished my undergraduate degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. I finished my PhD. I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. I finished my postdoc. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And it's only after postdocs, only 12 years after finishing my undergrad that I really fell into the, the thing I wanted to do. And it's, and I'm not unique in that. My wife changed roles in her late thirties into the job she does and loves now, but that you know that's twenty years of working before she found the right job for her. So, so what what does she is she a scientist as well? So my wife's a scientist and she works for a charity called the Wellcome Trust. And mm-hmm. so she but she came into that role kind of after doing working as an academic scientist and an industrial scientist, and then moved into the charity sector. So there's lots of kind of there's lots of different routes through the path. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'd like to take you back to um, of, of, of these medical, many critical junctures in your career. I'd like to take you maybe back to the first one. So let's go in. You've, you've done this uh, undergraduate degree. Your supervisor has really inspired you. You've learned this. Uh, you, you've learned that you've got this new uh, result that no one else has seen before. Um, what did you then consider doing after an undergraduate degree and, and, and why? So, so I then went on a prolonged holiday to America. So I went nice. for a four months trip where I worked in a whole range of different things, but mainly I worked in a um, outdoor education center. So I, I did, we did training how to climb, do mountain climbing and kayaking. And, but the thing that changed while I was there was that the, there was an emphasis on education and it wasn't, it was much more about learning. Again, it came back to this sort of learning to learn rather than the subject I was doing. So being somewhere educational made me think, well, actually, no, I do want to go and learn more. And that's what led me kind of that autumn to start applying for PhDs. Did you know the rough area of a PhD you wanted to go? Why did you apply to certain things? I had no clue when, when I was applying, which was, 20 years ago there wasn't it was it was all it's also it sounds very kind of spit and sawdust but there was a book called the mini ucker which was like a big fat yellow telephone directory so it was about uh i don't know it was about two inches thick and it had every phd project available in the uk for that coming october and what you do is you'd look in one october you'd look in the book and you'd just go through and circle the ones you're interested in and then you'd write to these supervisors and say here i am here's my cv um, I'm interested in doing your project. And I kind of applied for a bunch of different things. Uh, for some reason, I found this one at Imperial mm-hmm. and it clicked and I liked the idea of the project. And that was kind of the one I chose. Nice. Cool. So what was it? What was your PhD in then? So my PhD was looking at whether you can make genetic transgenic oh, sorry, transgenic plants that express vaccines. So we took a tobacco plant and we introduced genes from the tetanus uh, bacteria so that you could then use the leaves of the plant as a vaccine so it's kind oh, of wow. an affordable vaccine did it work I don't, yeah 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 so no it, so it so what's really satisfying is that not only did it work i uh, say so it worked and we kind of we we could show that you could immunize mice with these proteins but 20 years later they're a not nothing to do with me but that that kind of that early work had led into a huge phase three vaccine efficacy trial using tobacco plants to make flu vaccines which had a which came out and was equivalent to the inject the normal um, egg manufactured flu so the kind of the field i worked in ages ago has developed into something that which has a translational value so is it being used in the real world now so it, uh, I don't know if it's been licensed yet, but it has, it's got through efficacy. So it is effective. So this, this kind of, yeah, this sort of slightly wacky idea that we weren't the only group doing it. There was like three or four groups at the time has then expanded it as a field into kind of a much bigger area. Oh, awesome. Um, I, and I mean, like just as a, a technical thing, I, I'm assuming that, you know, the, um, you, you're taking these leaves and you're sort of like extracting the the molecules you're not simply eating the leaves right yeah no so, so we had an idea that you could just eat the leaf yeah that, immunologically that doesn't work so the 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 current versions do just use it as a protein factory yeah okay but we had a slightly more crude kind of mashed up approach to it but it, it worked so you did your phd at imperial for um a, was it this a three four year phd uh it was three years yeah. three years okay so you do this phd and then you come to the next critical juncture and you're kind of thinking what do i do now so um could you take us through the thought process of like what 
yeah, or just what what you were considering, the different options, um, and and what you actually then went for. Yeah, so I got to the writing up stage of the PhD, which is kind of three months of just being locked in a room by yourself, and it's pretty um, it's not the most fun thing. Uh, just to warn anyone doing it. So I am final year PhD student, but we've been locked down for a year, so I know it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're ready for it. Uh, so we, yeah. I was I was pretty fed up, and I applied for a lot of different things. I applied for a couple of civil service jobs. I applied for, I don't know, a management consultancy type things, all, all fairly route one not very imaginative kind of what are other people that i know doing type jobs yeah the one that kind of got closest was actually during my phd i was uh, in the reserve forces as an army officer and as i was graduating from my phd was the beginning of the iraq the second iraq war and there was an opportunity to go and be mobilized and go to iraq and that was quite a big like well I could do that but that I think that would have taken my life down a very very different path to where I am now. and I think yeah. it, on reflecting it was the right decision but it, that was probably the m- most tempting not science thing that I didn't do but what happened was my one of the people that I'd done my PhD with uh, Professor Tracy Hustle who's now at Manchester she knew of a role uh, in an immunology lab in at St Mary's in uh, another imperial different part of imperial but within immunology and she suggested that I go and speak to my postdoc supervisor and and talk to him about the project and kind of slightly fell into that project that way all right okay so um so yeah cuz the what advice then would you give to people like i know you you sort of did it in a kind of yeah, you fell into it sort of way. But what if you, if you're now being super critical? How what's the what's what's the best advice that you would give to someone? I I think on reflection, what I came to realize was that a PhD is a training in doing science, and I actually wanted to then go and do science. So having spent three years training to do a job, I then wanted to actually go and try to to actually do the job properly as a kind of you know having done the training. That, that was the kind of reflection that I came back to on, on, about how what I was doing. Um, I, I guess the only advice I can give is that it's, you know, don't don't feel constrained by a plan. Mm-hmm. You know, take the opportunities as they come uh, or look, you know, make make the make the connections. Making connections is vital, like having a network of people who, who will support you. And point you in the right direction is really critical. Yeah, there's no, there's no gold standard for what to do. There's no, uh, there's no. This is the thing that makes it so difficult, but also the thing that makes it so exciting at the same time, is that there is no path, and you have to carve it out for yourself. And it is quite a difficult thing to be able to, um, to to know what you're going to do with the rest of your life. So, for instance, when you're um, when you're younger and you're uh, you're at school, for instance, you pick your A levels and you think, oh, I need to pick those because it'll set me up for the right job. And then you graduate from university, and then you're like, oh, well, this job I'm going to be in for the next like twenty years. But I, I know people who've who've been in jobs for two or three years and absolutely hated it and done a completely like different thing in their careers. So it's one of those things that yeah, I think personally uh you should do what intrigues you the most and what you were saying about wanting to use the training that you've got as you know you've you've spent all this time getting trained seems like a bit of a waste unless you really hated it to not put all these skills into into action but the training's not just i think there's two bits to it. the training's not just about science it's science thought as much as moving liquids around with a pipette so actually, even if you don't stay in postdoc, and lots of people, you know, half the PhD students won't stay in postdoc, but you're taking your learning of what of how to problem solve into other jobs. So that's not it's not like it's wasted three years because you, you know, first of all, it's it's fun most of the time. Yeah. You, you make really good friends. You do something different. Um, so I think there's a lot of, there's lots of positives about it, and you go off and and do other things. So if I look at my phd students the ones who've come out of my lab one of them is still doing academic science and the rest of them are doing science related jobs but in a whole range of different fields one of them's working for the chief scientific officer in the in the civil service one of them's a doctor 
another one's a science writer, one works on vaccines. So there's a huge range of jobs out there. So you, you can apply this knowledge in a different way. Yeah. Um, the other bit, I think, is I've probably... It's if you you don't make very many big decisions in your life, actually, if really looking back, things, you know, there's very few like uh, sliding doors moments where you're like, I could go that way or I could go that way. I can I think I could count them on one hand where I've kind of like, yeah, I have to make a choice now. Yeah. A lot of it is things just sort of happen and you just have to make it fit around, make the job fit around what you want rather than kind of fit yourself to the job that you don't want. That's a really good way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so I'd like to close the section out by asking you one final question about this. And it's, had you, when you were a kid, uh, did you always picture yourself going down this kind of career path? Or what did you, um, what did you really want to, to do? I always wanted to be a soldier. Uh, that was what I imagined I'd do. Uh, and I did it part time. And I think that, you know, scratch that itch. I don't think I imagined I would be what I am now. And I don't think there's, you know, I don't think any child is able to say that that's because the job's so weird and random and different. It's not like I'm in a lab. I kind of sit in an office most of the time thinking about ideas. So I no, I, it's not what I imagined I'd be doing. Fair enough. I don't, yeah, I agree. I don't think most people, <laughs> most people realize either. So yeah. So thank you very much. For our next section, we're going to talk about your experiences in science. And unlike other interviews, we're going to split this one up into two parts because um, for the first part, and it's something that I hadn't previously considered, and it's it's a really, really like crucial, integral thing. But for the first part, I'd, I'd maybe just like to talk about um, what it's like being a working parent. So what are the trials and tribulations of being a working parent in science? And I think I'd first like you to answer this question from the perspective of, of you as a male, and then maybe also as a female, if if you can. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm best placed to speak from my own experience, which is probably not the same, uh, you know, it, it, it will have common elements to other people, but n not necessarily, you know, there'll be some unique experiences as well. So I'm a I'm a father of a 13 year old and an 11 year old. So that is the end of primary school and kind of just before GCSEs to put it into context. Um, we had our children at the end of my postdoc, but before I knew that I had a permanent position. So we decided that there was never necessarily an ideal time to have children. So we thought we'd rather have them and, and sort of deal with the problems as they arise. So do you mind me asking how old you were then at that time? So I was 30, which is uh, in probably in my generation, relatively young uh, compared to my parents, relatively old. Uh, yeah. So there's a bit of there is a bit of a shift. So I think if we look around at our children, like the peer group of parents at the schools, our children at, we tend to be at the younger end of it marginally by a couple of years. But if you kind of look elsewhere, like historically maybe we're a bit older mm -hmm. um so we have two children um the it has changed over time and i think it increase i what's the impact i mean it, it changes the hours of the day that you can work so i think i'm you know because i'm a pi i can fit my time a bit more flexibly i don't think i'd be able to do the massive complicated time point, you know, the, the sort of 16 hour experiments would be tricky or at least require some coordination and management with my wife about when I was going to go in and when I wasn't going to go in. It makes you more efficient. I think one of the things I've always thought about is that I spent a lot of my PhD mucking about with friends and I spent quite a lot of my postdoc mucking about and just like being at work but not being productive yeah and like i luckily had that buffer of like <laughs> probably when i should have been working harder and hopefully my bosses won't hear this at the time <laughs> but that that has gone like the the amount uh, it's still i mean yeah no I, I, the amount of time uh, the efficiency per hour is probably much higher now because i know that you know when the kids were little you used to have to you know you have to drop them at nursery at x and you have to pick them up at six and if you were late, you got charged a pound a minute, which kind of focuses you to wow. get out of work and be there to pick them up. So 
the the kind of working practice and the way that you kind of manage your time becomes a it becomes more efficient on some levels um i think they are they've been a massive generator of change so if uh, you know having children every year is different so the the way they are this year is different the way the things we can do with them this year is different to what we could do last year so each year you you know you kind of get these different things to do you don't just do the same thing over and over again so it's very sort of positive on that level um mm -hmm. i think i mean life life would be e like just crudely life would be easier without children that's you know there is just more time they, they do course. take up a lot of time yeah. they cost a lot of money life <laughs> is easier without them uh on that like that really blunt level but not it would be less satisfactory. Yeah, it's you, you're not richer for it, are you? It's, yeah, and I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it's it, it's very difficult for me to comment in this because I'm I'm very much in that sphere where I I don't have children, and um, it's just interesting to see how your life would potentially change. Like you know, it's sort of at the back of your mind, like oh well, I'll have to have responsibilities, I have to do this, that, and the other. But you don't actually think what the actual implications are. So for somebody like yourself. Um, you know you you maybe have to uh, maybe if your kids are a little bit older now but a few years ago you'd have to take them to school and and pick them up so um how did you go about like arranging that around your work life yeah so we so what's shifted a bit over time so I'll, I'll i'll come back to that but one thing that's shifted is the division of responsibilities and i i at several points assumed i was doing 50 percent of the workload but it's never quite been that way and i think maybe we came into it the societal expectations is often on the mum to pick up the slack or do uh, not necessarily the logistics but often it's the planning or the thinking ahead is, is often falls on the mother and we slowly have balanced that so we're doing about half and half of the thinking which is kind of the hard bit like the you know once it's thought out the kind of plans go ahead but it what do you mean by the thinking so like knowing that you've got to book the swimming lessons and knowing that you have to like noticing that the school uniform's getting small but the shop will be shut on sunday so you have to get yeah, it on the okay. there's That's lots it. of kind of it's almost like experimental planning you know like if you know you've got an experiment <laughs> coming up but you haven't got any tips. You can't do the study. You know, there's a bit of like, if you haven't thought through part X, part A, then B, C and D can't all happen. Right. And often the kind of pressure to think about stuff, and it may be different, like couple to couple, but often that kind of pressure falls on, on the mum. And that is an extra burden. So like what needs to, what has, is changing slowly is that pair, where, what they've seen is that when dads take, paternity leave and do it an extended period of time looking after the children they begin they get better at thinking of the logistics ahead so when they become the sole parent they get better at doing the logistics which then evens it out so one of the kind of big changes that will change society is that more shared parental leave and more kind of sole care for dads actually then takes a lot of the kind of logistic pressure off the mums so that that was just that, that was kind of an interesting thing for us but i can't what was the Go back to. Do you want to just ask the question again? Uh, yeah, no, it was more about like um, sorting out your your uh, your work life around because uh, obviously, yeah, you'd have to arrange it around the children. So, is it the case like I've heard that some people uh, they switch it between the um, the parents such that one person has their work hours seven till three, and then um, and then uh, the, uh, they pick the child up from school, and then somebody else. You know, it's it's staggered such like that. Um, is that something that you did? No, so what we did is we spent money on nurseries and then on nannies. And that just having the extra childcare was the only way we could manage it. And one of the one of the interesting bits about that is if there's a book called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg and she describes how that that cost shouldn't be seen as a cost but as an investment. So mums that carry on working and invest money in nursery time double their salary post the children so the the mums who carried on working go off and earn far far more than mums who stop work and then come back into it because basically that that 10 years is lost so viewing the nursery and the nanny costs as an investment means that you kind of you're not like oh we're losing money you're you're investing in a future earning thing so both people then have equity and both people carry on working equally amount. So, so it becomes kind of an equal responsibility. And that so that was how we managed that problem. 
That's a really interesting way to think about it. I mean, often um, you hear about how uh, women in particular, they have, um, you know, they, they have, they, they do take, they end up taking the career breaks more than, more than men do. And then it means they're, you know, a little bit further down the ladder to use an analogy. Um, but yeah, I, I'd never uh, thought about um, nurseries as an investment like that. And I think that's, that's really interesting. So um I, I, maybe just a, a quick um, idea about because I, I don't want to go into it too much because obviously you are not a, f- a female, but um, from the perspective of a female, um, the expectation is is certainly on on them uh, to to do more of the of the work. Like how how is how is what's that like in in, in terms of a scientist? Uh, like in in terms of working scientist. So I, I think it's it all. I think it's that the it comes back to that expectation and that the. Uh, often things are set up either expecting expecting the mum to be there or expecting somebody to be able to do something at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. And like there's a key, say a key meeting about the curriculum is put at two o'clock and like pre teams, one of you'd have to be there or you just didn't, you know, or you just missed it. And there were lots of like, oh, but why didn't you come and see my class open day? It's like, well, we were both running experiments that day. We couldn't, you know, we had to do that to keep our job. So the, the, often the setup is expects, expects a parent to be not working. And within that expects the mum to be, essentially the mum to be not working. So my, my only, like the, the oddest experience I had was I went to a sing-along nursery thing at a library and the l- person leading it said to me, "Oh, hairy knees. We don't see those very often." And then didn't speak to me. And it was, and it was just <laughs> like I felt complete. And I know this is a silly example, but it's kind of like the expectation is that my wife should be there and I shouldn't. So I, I think that it's just that kind of burden of expectation. And I wouldn't want to kind of over, yeah, say what her experience has been like. But I, I think the quicker that we get away from that, the easier it will make it and the fairer it will make it. And, you know, that, that's got to be better for everyone. Really. No, definitely. But it's, it, you know, it is, it is more uh, a cultural thing and I totally agree. It's not, it, it isn't fair. Um, it should be 50, 50, uh, all, all responsibilities divided. It really, it really, really should. But then, you know, the way that it's sort of structured into, I, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of it necessarily, but, you know, I do know things like maternity leave is, is, is often much longer than, um, paternity leave but I think there was uh, there was some sort of trial in Sweden where they had uh, fathers who were able to um, have a, as long a, of a time away from work as, as mothers and I think that um, that kind of approach is really better I do think the Scandinavians are uh, leading in, in, in that um, in that respect uh, what do you think? No I think it, I think if you could get equal amounts of paid paternity leave um, and what they do in Iceland is that you either take it or you lose it it forces it forces the dads to take it and you can take it you know you take it after the sort of biological need for the mother to you do it at six months where they don't necessarily need milk in the same way and then it completely changes the dynamic of the couple it changes which child the you know which parent the child goes to you know the, the sort of classic oh i've fallen over i'll go to mummy <laughs> they they'll often go to both parents there's a huge there's lots and lots of benefits and one thing i'd really like to see uk science embrace is paid equal paid parental leave that no, would be really nice i yeah i agree um i'd now like to maybe just talk about what your perception is of uh of working parents so perhaps when you're a phd student you would well yeah maybe you could tell me like or a postdoc like what was your perception of 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 working parents and then and basically how has that changed over time i, I think there probably was i guess I think if I was honest, yeah, you, you see people leave it for, you know, as a PhD, you know, as, as, as a young male PhD student, I probably saw people leaving at five and thought, oh, where are they going? Why do they always go at five? And I think, I hope that that has changed a bit. And I hope that if, you know, me being able to say, stand up and say, right, I'm leaving this meeting now because I've got to go, I'm picking up my kids. Um, I do that reasonably often. I just get up and, and walk out and explain it. Um, and I hope that creates a space where other people feel comfortable doing it. And I hope that, that you know, understanding that we all kind of are working flexible time anyhow and, and picking it up, you know, often you stop at X and you carry on later and, and people move it around gets easier. But I can see why it would be, especially if you're a 
PhD student, it could be feel intimidating or challenging to just to say, I've got to go now. I've got to stop this now and feel like under pressure. So I, I don't know what the perception is of people mm. kind of stopping at a certain point. Do you think um, it's acceptable? Um, yeah. Well, to me, yes, I think it's perfectly acceptable. I think, you know, it, you've got to do it. It's not like you don't have a choice. It's not like I'm going off to play Xbox. I'm going home to do uh, <laughs> yeah. the thing I need to do to look after my children and to support, you know, and, and for us to uh, function as family. If, if my, my wife has a much more outward facing role and has to be places more set times than I do. So therefore she, she, we have to fit it around to make it work for both of us. So what, what I sort of mean by the acceptable thing is more that, um, so in your contract, you're usually contracted to work, uh, between the hours of nine and five, for instance, like, so, so is it, is it then, um, for people who are potentially unsure about this, is it acceptable to say, I mean, I know everyone has embraced working practices, but I need to leave at three o'clock. Uh, is is it, you know, if, if your boss is not okay with that, then, you know, what do you do? I mean, that is really challenging. Don't work for that boss. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, mean, I was going to say, just quit. The, like, way yeah. the, labs should, the labs should be should be set up so there's there, there's core hours where people are in so they can be together and talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And that's try, I try and keep my lab so it's 10 till 3 core hours. But I expect people to do the seven-hour day one end or the other. You know, fit, yeah. it, fit it and make it work for the best for you. Um, uh, I don't know how to advise people who who are in that kind of position where they're not getting the support they need you know the you have to then go outside your line management structure speak to you know the edi team in your department or speak to a a mentor or or get some support from other people within the department if if it's challenging but you shouldn't feel under pressure if you've got to go and and do something childcare related or or carer you know care i'm being very kind of focused downwards but you know caring elderly relatives is is equally a pressure and and should be supported in the same way so there's lots of things that people can't control and we as uh employers and pis need to be understanding of those pressures and and make it work best as we can otherwise we're going to lose good people yeah you are um definitely and i yeah i could not agree more really 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 well said um okay for the second part and uh, this is again the section is all about your experiences in science. So, what has been your most memorable experience in science? The thing that just sticks out in your mind that you just think, <laughs> "Oh, that was yeah. awesome." Uh, it sounds really flippant, but conferences. I love going to conferences with my friends. I just, I think that that kind of esprit de corps where you, you you're just with mates and you're talking about science and you're thinking about science. And you get a couple of hours off and you just go and, you know, you have time to have decent thoughts about things. It just breaks up the routine. I, I yeah, I, my favorite, a lot of my favorite moments have been just discussing ideas and it kind of, it sparks off the next, next thought and the next idea and, and then the next wave. So um, I think they're, they're my favorite. Which conferences, which, which location has been the best one or your most favorite Sorry. one? So I, I love small conferences. I like the little, the ones with like 200 people where you get to chat to every single person who's there and, and understand what they're working on and see if it fits into something I'm doing or if we could collaborate or ideas. So the, the, the it's called the Gordon conferences are my kind of favorite because they're small and focused and uh, you're stuck in like one place for a week. So you have to talk to everyone. So the kind of social ones. The other one I really like is my, the, the one in my field, the British Society of Immunology, because that's kind of it, it friend so many described it as like a family gathering with some science. It's a kind of like lots of, you know lots of people and you get to chat to lots of people. So it, it doesn't necessarily have to be physically anywhere fancy. It just has to involve like science and their social life. Yeah, fair enough. What was the uh, what was the biggest challenge you faced as a student? Um I nothing worked for the first nine months of my PhD. <laughs> there was no plasmid like the the key thing I needed didn't turn up for six months and I was just doing a dead end project, which I hated. I very, very nearly quit. Oh, really? Uh, I went in, I, I, I went and kind of had a real kind of uh, angry breakdown at my boss. And he was like, okay, go to America for six months, set up the project. We'll get it going over there. You can do the work there and then come back and kind of test it. And that, and that kind of drove the project forward. But that first nine months was, it was, 
really unproductive, really frustrating, and I, yeah, I really didn't enjoy that. So that was part of your PhD. You took so um, six months, uh, uh, like a placement at another university. Um, yeah. So we the, there was a collaborator based in uh, Rutgers University in New Jersey who had the kind of the plant transformation technology set up, and so I just went to his lab and I did all the plant transformations there. Oh, okay. And, and kind of and, and and built the project up from there, and then came back and, and kind of tested it in another lab. Well, that's really good that that was able to be arranged like that because, yeah, often, yeah, it, sometimes it, it does take a while. Like in my own research, I had a, a similar thing. Nothing worked for uh, a long time, and I, I eventually learned how to how to do uh, the, the the fabrication techniques that I needed to do uh, myself. But I do I do wish that I, I would have been able to have been sent somewhere. Someone could have taught me. But it does teach you other things like resilience, I suppose, and how to really troubleshoot from the ground up. So. Yeah, yeah, it depends which way you want to look at it, which day you catch me on. I'll give you a different answer. Um, uh, what was the best piece of advice that somebody ever gave you? That you live by, maybe. Uh, what I like is, is, is that leadership isn't a popularity contest. I think that's, that's, a, I think that's a useful piece of advice, is that okay. actually you have to make difficult decisions. You have to be unpopular at times. And that's part of, you know, that's part of your job. So I, I think that's a, that's one that springs to mind quite often. Final uh, question for the section then would be um, just essentially in general, what would your top work life balance advice be? And I, I, it can apply to anybody at any stage, but just, yeah, what, what would you say? So there's two bits of it. One is that if you are happy four days out of five, then that's the, that's okay. That's a reasonable <laughs> number. And the second is just do something that you enjoy. Uh, like if you're doing it and you're enjoying it, then it doesn't matter how much you're working or not working or being paid because it, it doesn't feel like work. If you're doing something miserable and you hate it, then the work-life balance will feel like it's out of kilter. But if you're enjoying it, then that moves the work-life, the, the kind of your work is your life. It kind of it all gets overlaps closer. So find things you enjoy, accept that you're not going to enjoy everything and and try and 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 shape the shape the space so you're doing more of the stuff you like and less of the stuff you don't. Mm. Do you have any kind of imposter syndrome? And if you do, how did you, how do you overcome it? Um. Yes. Frequently, the the most often is comparing upwards. So looking at from me up into the professors with all their publications and their papers and their money. Uh, the easiest way to fix that is to look and say, well, look how far I've come. Look, yeah. you know, compare, make, if, you, if you're the type of person who needs to make comparisons, make comparisons that are going to make you feel better. Don't make comparisons that make you feel worse. That's really good advice. This next section is all about your passions outside of science. So, what do you like to do in your leisure time? I've, I've noticed that you, uh, you, you're a very active blog writer and before you mentioned about your book. So I wondered if you could tell us all about those. Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, the things I like to do um, are I, I'm a, a keen runner. Uh, that's how I kind of de-stress. Um, I'm lucky to have a garden and an allotment and I like pottering around in those <laughs> and I like writing. So I like, I've, I've uh, been writing a blog for about four years and at the beginning of lockdown, um, I started writing a book about infectious diseases. Oh, nice. So what, what's, your, what's your blog about? So the blog is mostly career, uh, it's, it's kind of science career thoughts about like different bits of the career. And like it started as a kind of just a, uh, a small blog. And then I spoke to an editor at Nature Careers and started writing for them and also for the Times Higher Education. So it kind of went from being sort of a very small audience to writing for these other more commercial places. And it's it's kind of like what it's like to be an academic, uh, some tips. What, and uh, often some of the things I write for Times Higher often, they're like, well, what are your thoughts about this specific issue? And then sort of write. 500 words about no i think your blog is awesome i um i actually stumbled across it um i don't know when it was maybe a year year and a half ago and that was when yeah um when i had this idea for the podcast i was thinking right like back of my mind john is a person i very very much need to to speak to uh so i your blog is very good where can people find it
Fair enough. Um, No, definitely. And I'd, I'd encourage anyone listening to go and check uh, check John's blog out. It's uh, yeah, it's really, really good. Um, you mentioned then about a book, though. Uh, so you're writing a book on infectious diseases. Is this a textbook? Um, what is it? No, so it's a popular science book. So I, I, I'd, I'd done the blogging and I was quite I thought, well, what's the next thing to do? And quite wanted to write a book. And so I spoke to a professor at Manchester called Dan Davis, who's written a couple of books. And he said, well, speak to the to his agent and I chatted to her and she didn't like my idea uh, but she had a different idea and, and at the time which was about September probably summer 2019 uh, I kind of didn't quite have the time or the headspace to do the idea that she'd suggested but then when the labs all shut in March uh, 2020 I thought well actually no maybe I will try and, and, and kind of build up this idea so the book is about, it's a kind of guide to in different infectious diseases, but it's a bit about immunology, epidemiology and diagnostics, and then moves into vaccines and antibiotics and antivirals. So it's a kind of like, what are the diseases that can infect people and what are we doing about them and why are we living mm. to 100 when 100 years ago we lived to 50? Mm. And so that kind of process, we, uh, I spoke to her, she helped me write a, a sales pitch that then went to a publisher and then I've had an, I've been kind of writing it and editing it ever since really. Nice. So what's it called? It's called Infectious. Infectious. Awesome. Yeah. What was your original idea that she didn't like? <laughs> so the original idea was like a career, like a, a more like an autobiographical, like how to be a scientist. And it yeah. was a bit too niche, but it was, it was kind of, it was like the blog, but kind of written longer. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, when is it going to be available? October the 14th. Oh, this you, year. Can, you can see it on uh, it is on Amazon now so you can pre-order it <laughs> which is very exciting it's feeling increasingly real that's awesome that's really exciting I can't wait to um, to read it yeah uh, congratulations uh, if you if you need a proofread for whatever reason I'd be very happy to, <laughs> to, to give it a look over um, finally yeah um, are you a passionate advocate for anything you don't have to be necessarily it's just um, yeah what what uh... I I would want research culture to be more fair and kinder. Mm -hmm. uh, so that drives a lot of what I do. I'm not sure passionate advocate is... Maybe it's, it's not the right word for it. I'm not sure that would fit my description, but it, everything I want to do in science is to do it in a way that we can all improve together and like so not the zero sum game model where like some people win and everyone else loses but yeah. like bring everyone up together so if, if we can make the department the college the science like that across the board that would be a nice thing yeah uh i mean sign me up i'm with you i'm with you on that one for sure um okay so very finally a few final thoughts so these are just a few quick fire questions and i'm going to try and get you to to forecast what you what you think so what would be your well firstly what would your advice be to young people uh right now there's a lot of young people who are struggling in terms of uh, pandemic and career options not being available now um what would your advice to young people be it, keep plugging away um it is difficult for everyone everyone at different levels is having different problems and it's hard for everyone you're not alone you know speak to people take exercise get out there and, and do you know embrace nature as far as you can go to parks and things um but yeah just you just have to keep plugging away in it's not great it's not helpful but it's, it's what you need to do yep stick at it um we we have discussed a little bit about this uh earlier in terms of vaccines but but how do you see the future of your field um so i think there's three things that are going to change your diagnostics will get faster and better I think we will get better vaccines for a whole range of different diseases. There'll be new vaccines coming up, a TB vaccine. I think there will be an HIV vaccine one day. Uh, and gene therapy. I think we might get to individualised gene therapy. or under, there'll be a, The genomics revolution has not played itself out yet, so I think there'll be a lot in that area as well. Yeah, so that kind of ties into the next, the next question. In, um, 
well, it, it might feature in this answer or not, but in science in general, which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential to affect any kind of change? In general, um, I think the combination of the cheapness of sequencing everyone's gen genomes, you know, that's a thousand dollars now, who knows where it'll be in, in, in 10 years time. Yeah. And then the ability to edit it in a safe and meaningful way. Hmm. Okay. I mean, there is a lot of privacy concerns around this. And obviously people, uh, the, the, the only thing that you can ever claim as truly yours is your DNA, I suppose. So yeah, there's a lot of um, privacy issues. And I think a lot of people are quite concerned about, about this. But I do think, yeah, in time, it may get more mainstream, or at least some people will adopt it more. But then yeah, there's a lot of question marks, particularly in my mind, about what is done with this information, who gets it, where it goes. So I think that that yeah, and I, and I and I think being being not just signing up stuff, be careful about yeah. who sequences your DNA for you. Yeah, uh, definitely. Is obviously, a, a thing people may not have thought about ten years ago. Yeah, very true. Very true. Um, very final question: uh, If you could do everything all over again, what would you keep the same, and what would you change? <laughs> oh i don't know it's a tough one we had a few interesting answers i'd be worried about changing anything because i'm by and large happy i think i'd you know i think i'll settle for the, the half full cup i've got rather than end up with a four, quarter full cup so so no regrets not urgently good I mean, that's a really good place to be. Like, you don't have to want to change anything. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm happy all the time. It's that eighty twenty thing. But, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's okay. I think. Yeah, no, good for you. I mean, we had a we had a response from Tom McKinnon was that he changed nothing but party harder. So I thought that was a, <laughs> <laughs> thought that was fair enough. So. Go, yeah, go go to more con go to more pop concerts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Enjoy yourself a bit more. But that's perfect. Thank you so much for giving up your time today, John. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, uh, thank you everybody who's listening. Please make sure you, you get onto his blog, uh, you, you buy his book when it comes out eventually. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and just generally give us some feedback. Um, but thank you for listening and thank you very much, John. Thanks, Alex. Well, there we have it. How RNA vaccines work, that they're safe, they're effective, and they've got amazing potential over the next few decades to really transform healthcare. I'm incredibly grateful to John for giving up his time and I hope this proved valuable to anyone listening. I certainly learned a thing or two. Please make sure to keep subscribing and follow us on your Twitter and YouTube platforms. Also, rate us on your podcast platform because this helps out a huge deal when it comes to metrics and would very much be appreciated. The next episode is going to be released in two weeks time, which is Wednesday the 21st of April. And this is going to be a special feature episode dedicating to the, discussing all about cell sensing. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Matthew Walker uh, of the University of Glasgow, and we're going to talk about how cells are able to sense and respond to their environments. It's going to be really cool. So until then...